Padram Karnevi Shunuyama Deva Padram Pasye Makshabhirya Jatra Stirae Rangae Estushuvagam Sastanubi Yasema Deva Hitai Yadayuhu May we hear with our ears what is auspicious. May we see with our eyes what is auspicious. May we enjoy with strong limbs and bodies the life allotted to us. The subject is Swami Subodhananda, a direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. By studying the lives of these great souls who came or who were raised, you one could say, as the children of spiritual children of Sri Ramakrishna. By considering their lives, there's much to be learned. We understand the greatness of the teacher in many different ways, either directly or quite indirectly through what he or she does. And the people who are affected by the life of that great teacher. So we, it's, it's good to reflect on the lives of these, those who actually were able to come under the direct influence of Sri Ramakrishna. In the Bible, one of the statements made is, except ye become as little children, ye shall not enter in the kingdom, into the kingdom of heaven. So the question is, what is it about little children that makes them eligible for the kingdom of heaven and the rest of us remain ineligible? And it's the the innocence and the lack of ulterior motives that is what is so attractive. Swami Subodhananda was such, he was called Koka. So in the annals of the order, he's called Koka Maharaj, meaning he was like a little child. That was his attitude. That's what he manifested most in his, uh, in his while he was here uh, as the disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. He, like many, uh, children of his time and probably also of our time in certain societies, it, the children grow up in terms of stories. Mama tell me a story, so the, the story is something. What is it you one might wonder? Well, if it's a story, it may or may not be true to this or that extent. But the, for children, the idea is that the idea of falsehood doesn't really occur to them. Everything that they experienced, they take as true. And uh, so when anyone says anything, the child uh, utterly believes it. That's why it's, a, it's, it's not advisable or even dangerous to tell a child, oh, don't go into that particular area. There's a spook there. The child will absolutely believe it. Later on, when he grows up and uh, 
has had experiences in life, he will say, now, wait a minute, what did he or she mean by that? A spook, what do they mean? What is a spook and why should it be there? Have they seen it? Do they know for sure it is there? Can they prove it? <laughs> These are all the things that we <clears throat> pride ourselves in as adults. We carefully examine everything and uh, we don't accept anything until we have actually satisfied our uh, understanding that it is really true and that there is no, any uh, evidence to the contrary can be disproved. So we get a very legal or legalistic sort of approach. Children don't have that. They are, that's why, except <laughs> if you become, unless you become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The child is not, not that complicated. Whatever it is, he accepts it is. He doesn't want the basis of it. He doesn't want the understanding. What is the reason? What is the intellectual edifice on which it stands so that I can prove that this is correct and true. So this simplicity is what is cherished. Now you can say, well, you can be fooled that way. You can be told something which is not true and you come to believe it utterly. But in that case, it's the person who told the lie who has to suffer, not the person who accepts it with childlike sincerity. Of course, for the sake of truth, which is the foundation of all our existence, we do have to grow, as we say, grow up. We have to verify what we hear. We have to under make sure that our understanding is correct and all of that, that has to be done. But in the process, we lose something. And that something is something which is very difficult to get back. That innocence, the acceptance of truth, the reality, the expressence of that which is. Children see that more. They, they tend to see the reality as the as real, we tend to see the reality as something to be investigated and questioned and uh, analyzed. And for that reason, we consider ourselves grown up. And, and of course, in our regular existence in this world, we have to do all those things. In life, in the ordinary uh, conduct of life, all of this, everything has to be examined and carefully thought about. and. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna t said uh, to, of course, he was talking to adults. He said, test me like you test a coin to make sure if the, in the old days, of course, nowadays coins don't have much value anyway. It's all in paper. Paper is the value. But in the old days, things, uh, money was not in paper form. It was in the form of silver or gold or even copper or mixtures of metals. So people used to test the metal to make sure it was genuine, it wasn't fake. So uh, Sri Ramakrishna said, test me as money changers test their coins. That is for, that is a, a basis of our existence, truth is the is uh, satyam eva jayate. Truth alone triumphs. Non rhythm, not that which is not true. So definitely, we want to accept that which is true. But the psychology is what we're talking about now. The psychology of a person who is always testing. Is, has a tremendous advantage in, and is eventually what we want to get to. But in the beginning of our life, we don't do that. In the beginning of our life, this is called the age of innocence. 
we, someone says something and we accept it. As Sri Ramakrishna said, some of your mother tells you there's a ghost in that room, don't go in there. Of course, her motive was to keep you from going into that room. And she felt that uh, unless I put it that way, he's going to try, when I'm not looking, he's going to try to get into that room. <laughs> so, she, you know, she had his uh, well-being in mind in the process. But in that same motion, something also is lost. And that's something we re regain as we grow in spiritual life. Because the basic truth is that there is, actually there is no falsehood. There is no falsehood anywhere. If you examine anything to its uttermost level, it is seen as Brahman, Sarvam Khalu Idam Brahma. All of this, no exception made, everything indeed is Brahman. So Brahman is what is, is truth. Satyam Eva Jayati, Brahman itself is truth. So at the heart of everything, there is only truth, there's only Brahman, there's only God, there's only existence, however you want to phrase it. The surface of it has waves in it that appear and disappear. They come and go, and that is what we call untruth. That which stays, that which is eternal, that which is unchangeable, that is what we mean by truth. That which appears, is what we test to see, is it really true? Or how much of it is true? What is it, what is at the heart of it, is that true? So Swami Subodhananda was called Koka Maharaj, it means he was like a little child, in the sense he was uncomplicated, straight, direct, and which means that he was always focused on that which is central, on that which is important, on that which is crucial, on that which is unchangeable. Now, he came from a family that Sri Ramakrishna had known much before he was even born. In a section of Calcutta, so Sri Ramakrishna came uh, and lived in a section of C Calcutta before he became a priest of the Dakshineshwar Kali Temple. He came actually to help his brother with the, you know, his brother was teaching uh, spiritual, uh, Discipline, spiritual lessons and uh, scriptural study and Sanskrit. And so his, uh, he came to actually assist his brother. And he lived in a neighborhood in which there was a temple, a neighborhood called Tantanya. And there was a temple there which is family, which the family of Swami Subodhana, who, the, person who became Swami Subodhananda later, that family owned that temple. And so he was, Sri Ramakrishna was already familiar with these, uh, with, the, w with his family even before he was born. Now, even in boyhood, of course, in those days, I don't know whether that's still so much in practice now, one would hope so. The children are given a uh, spiritual education in the sense that they are told the stories of, uh, the, the stories that have been traditionally passed down of great saints and sages so the children who are brought up that way grow up in a, in a spiritual 
spiritually dedicated atmosphere. It's not that they, this is anything new for them. It's a question of how intensely they engage in that as they grow up. So, he, this uh, Subod, his name as, uh, his childhood name was also Subod. And uh, so it was arranged that, uh, I mean, his uh, schooling had been arranged by his family. And eventually he actually was transferred to the school that was run by Vidya Sagar, a great philanthropist in those days who, whom Sri Ramakrishna also visited. And uh, so that uh, M, who is the who recorded the conversation of Sri Ramakrishna, which was published and now as the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. So uh, Subod actually grew up in, or was his education continued in a school in which, which was highly oriented towards Sri Ramakrishna and his teachings. And of course, in those days, there was an organization which was very popular, and uh, it was called the Brahmo Samaj. And the leaders of that spiritual organization uh, were great admirers of Sri Ramakrishna and used to visit him. So Subodh had a natural or introduction to his future spiritual teacher. But he had not actually met him, so even though the family was very well known to him, Sri Ramakrishna knew his family, and uh, but the Subod had never gone there, so one day he and a friend went to try to find, because they had heard so much about Sri Ramakrishna, so they went to the Dakshineshwar Kali temple, not knowing exactly where it was. Nevertheless, they found it, and Sri Ramakrishna welcomed them. And actually, he had known before, had been, you could say, had been informed by the Divine Mother, however you want to phrase it. He had an idea that Subod was coming, so he welcomed him. And as was customary with him, he immediately encouraged his spiritual development and drew him close to him. The, it's, we usually think that we are the ones who have to do the work of approaching our spiritual guides if we if we want a spiritual guide. So we look for them and we try to uh, associate with them and draw close to them. But generally, it is found in the history of these, of, of the people uh, that we are aware of, it's the teacher that was seeking the student. And, you may wonder why that is, but I think generally if we look into it a little bit, I think in many cases it will be found that if there is a great spiritual inspiration that has come into our life, it isn't that we were looking for something, although it seems that way, the way we, uh, we approach or we view our own life. But actually, that what is generally found is the teacher was the one who was attracting the student. Sri Ramakrishna knew that Subod was coming. And uh, so when he saw him, he was prepared for him. And he was, he welcomed him and actually gave him some spiritual not only spiritual instructions, but uh, caused him to have a spiritual experience that would 
stamp on his mind the, the spiritual ideal in a firmer way. So actually, really it is the, the teacher who attracts the student. And that is quite reasonable because the student really doesn't know anything. He's looking for something and he's, he's going to be able to find out if the various things that he, or various paths that he uh, treads in, in this attempt to find truth, the student will understand after going along a certain path for a certain time that yes, this is for me, this, this is genuine, this is applicable in my case, this is something that is attractive to me. Slowly that idea dawns. But I think if we look at it carefully, we find really it is the teacher that's been looking for the student. And when the student comes, it is the teacher that is able to draw that person in. I think this happens more often than possibly we're willing to admit. Of course, we're always pretty proud of our own <laughs> uh, capacities and our own ability to search for things and to find the right thing and to land on it and accept it. But in many cases, it is found that the teacher is the one that actually attracts the student. And that only becomes obvious later. Anyway, it seemed to be in this case, Sri Ramakrishna told him, he knew he was coming, he was expecting him. So he welcomed him and uh, as was usual with him in that case, he thoroughly examined him to see his condition, to see his mental state, to see his outlook on things. Only then does he prescribe. It's like a, uh, a physician trying to determine what is your spiritual condition, what is your uh, medical condition. And when, it's only when the physician has made all the necessary tests and understands the situation that he can properly pres uh, prescribe the medicine. So this is in, in this particular case as well. Sri Ramakrishna told him that uh, he really belonged to this place that means to belong to the entourage, to the surroundings, to the uh, Sri Ramakrishna's way of life and way of doing things and to his, uh, the, his circle of devotees. So, this is the, uh, the, this was the beginning of his life in uh, Sri Ramakrishna. So then once uh, Subod asked uh, Sri Ramakrishna, well, if you knew that I was coming, if you knew that these things are inevitable, and uh, uh, why is it that you didn't, attract me earlier, why didn't I come earlier? I mean, he he knew his family and uh, he was, it was not such a, uh, f you know, such a difficult thing, but Sri Ramakrishna told him that when the time is ripe, then things of that sort happen, which is a great lesson for us. That means we don't we don't have to fret and fume and say, why is it that I'm not uh, progressing in spiritual life? You know, the point is we have the right to practice. We have the right to try. We have the right to struggle for what we need to get. But the results of it are not under, under our control. So, this is something which is profound in, our, in the very nature of things, that 
you, your, yours is the right to struggle. Yours is the right to try to achieve the right, the, the goal to do the right thing, to understand the depth of reality, to achieve greatness. That is what you struggle for. But the results, when the, the results will come according to the development of things. You have no control over the results. That is what is called karma yoga. In other words, yours is the right to work, but you don't have the capacity or it's not within our reach to be able to tell the results of what we do. We aim for that. We try to achieve certain things. And we constantly are on a, on a correcting course. We can correct our behavior. We see that what we do doesn't work. We have to correct it. That is our responsibility. Our responsibility is to do and to struggle and to act. The results will come of their own in the course of time. The results will come as things develop, as uh, as our uh, effort ripens. But we have no control over the results. We do have a control and, and complete control of what we do, of our actions. This is actually what is called karma yoga. <laughs> karma yoga, I mean, karma is action, what we do. Every action is karma. What makes it yoga is our intention. Our intention is to uh, realize that which is infinite, that which is permanent, that which is unchangeable. That is our goal. That is the goal of religion, to re realize that which is, which always was and which always will be. And so we have, ours is the right to struggle. But the results will come as we mature, as the maturing process goes on. You, you plant a tree somewhere or any plant, you have to do the, uh, prepare the soil, you have to sow the seeds, you have to water it, you have to uh, uh, give nourishment, you have to protect it in case of uh, uh, things that may destroy it. All those things we have the right to do. But what happens as a result of what we have done, that is, happens by the course of time, by the course of things, by the will of God, by the, uh, by the uh, laws of nature, whatever uh, instrument you want to call it, whatever however you want to describe it. So ours is the freedom to act, but the results will come in their own time. So as Sri Ramakrishna told Subodh, when Subodh asked him, well, why didn't you, you knew all of this, you knew my family, and you knew that I would come, and you knew that I was destined to, uh, you know, to be taught by you, why didn't you attract me earlier? Why didn't you, why didn't you leave me to struggle for so many years? And Sri Ramakrishna's answer was, well, things happen in the course of time. What he really, he, as he explained in other circumstances, it's the will of God, it's the will of the Divine Mother, however you want to phrase it, it's the nature of things that enables us to, that gives us the power to act, but not the power to achieve necessarily the results that we want. We have the right to, for course correction, that is always our responsibility to watch if what we do has uh, unsuitable circumstances, we have the right to change our course. But the results are not in our control, and that is the profound truth of karma yoga, which is so difficult to understand. 
But as a result of that, one acquires this reliance on that which does provide the results. What is it that brings the results? What is it that causes things to happen? We think we do things and we are able to start the process. But what is it that completes it? What is it that grants the fruits? That is what we call the grace of God. Because we can't explain it in any in, in, uh, you can explain it in a, in a scientific way. You can say, well, it's the, the water, you, you watered the plant and the water combined with the nourishments in the soil and then you give a chemical reaction and uh, some process, this pressure caused that to happen. You, you can have volumes of explanation. But the, the, the question that still remains at the end of it all is, what was the power that caused all of this to happen? What was the cause? Who was responsible for the whole process? I was not responsible in a certain sense, certain things I can do. But I am sitting in a, in a situation in which there's a very complex series of processes. So what is the nature? What is the... Uh, the impelling purpose of all of this. Ultimately, we find that this is called, in any case, Shakti, it's called Shakti, power of Shakti, the power of the Divine Mother, the power of Brahman, the, the ultimate reality. You can give it a thousand names and a thousand uh, arguments in favor of this or that view. But the point is that we are not the doers. <laughs> we are the ones who want the action. We are the, the wishers. But something else is the, the power that causes things to happen. And that is what Sri Ramakrishna referred to as the Divine Mother. This is what we call the power of God. This is the, that's why we pray, oh Lord, let this happen. If we were able to do everything, then why is there such a thing as prayer in this world? Ultimately, we realize that everything happens by the will of God. We call it the will of God. You can call it the, the process of science. Uh, you, you can call it the laws of nature, whatever you want. There is an intelligence in this universe that is at the heart of things. And that intelligence, we can't put any limits to it, either in space or time. And it is accessible. It, we have a way of influencing that, which we call prayer. So the whole process of what we are responsible for, what we can do, or actually what we are doing, is a complex thing. It's not just, I want to do this and I do it. That's how it appears. But at the heart of it, there are many more profound ideas. So, Swami Subodhananda was always, had always this innocence. He was called a boy, but he always had that innocent, uh, innocence about him. Even later on, he became a great, a great saint. He initiated many disciples. He traveled to many places and uh, taught spirituality, taught, uh, you know, the, the, the spiritual ideals. He became, a, when the order was established, he became one of the trustees of the order. There are certain things that are told about him. For instance, once Swami Vivekananda 
he disturbed uh, Swami Vivekananda while he was Swami Vivekananda was meditating or something. Anyway, Swami Vivekananda said to him, "All right, what is it that you want? I want to give you a boon." <laughs> they were always joking a little bit. So uh, Swami Subodhananda said, "Well, Sri Ramakrishna has given us everything. What can I ask for? All right." Grant me that I never miss my morning cup of tea. So Swamiji said, oh, you rascal, that's what you want? All right, let it be. And it turned, actually turned out that way. Later on in his life, Swami Vivekananda passed away in 1902, and Swami Subodhananda passed away in 19, I think, 32. Anyway, later on, someone asked him, is it, was Swamiji's boon, was it actually accomplished? Did that really happen? He says, yes. He says, he never, I never had to, uh, to uh, suffer for want of a cup of tea if I wanted one in the morning. So, but he went, he went on uh, many pilgrimages later, and he, uh, as I said, he was a member of the trustees of the order. I think he may have become one of the officers also. But he always retained that childlike spirit. On his first visit to Sri Ramakrishna, Actually, Sri Ramakrishna awakened his spirituality right away. On his first visit, or actually the second visit, he touched him and said, Mother, awake, awake, Mother, which was one of the uh, ways that Sri Ramakrishna used to act with his very close disciples. And that touch awakened in him a great spiritual experience and spiritual realization. And later on, uh, when he was, uh, after Sri Ramakrishna had passed away, he traveled all over India as a wandering monk. And uh, as a wandering monk, there is, they t really, one, is, one takes nothing with one. There's no, there's no food, there's no shelter. He simply, on one particular occasion, he simply walked out and kept on going, entirely dependent on the will of God. Of course, when we go anywhere, we first of all get our tickets, make sure they're right. We get a suitcase, make sure we have what we need, and uh, all the, yes, I need some washing materials, I need some extra clothing, I need some this and that, and we pack our suitcases and then make sure they get put on the plane in the proper, in the proper way. And, uh, but these great souls, they simply went. There is an instance in the, uh, in the Brahadaranya Gopanishad, the great sage Yagyavalkya, who is the basic teacher of the Brahadaranya Gopanishad. And he left, when he, he was married, he had a household. At some point, uh, the, he took the traditional way that every householder after he has seen his children's children, after he has seen his grandchildren, he, his obligations in this world, physical obligations, in mental, I mean, uh, financial obligation, whatever, uh, are over because his son is now taking care of responsibility. And so he is, has been freed and that freedom enabled, doesn't, uh, he doesn't go to uh, Hawaii and have a grand old time uh, by the seashore. 
What he does is he renounces the world, he enters the forest and begins great uh, intense spiritual life. The point is, the idea is once one has finished one's uh, obligations in this world, what is one going to do? Is one going to relax on a Pacific island and uh, watch the surf pound on the, on the sand of the seashore? What is the, uh, what happens? <laughs> what development does that show? No, the ancient idea was that once one's obligations in this world have been fulfilled, once you have seen the children of your children, then it is a time to spend, your obligations have been accomplished, it's time to spend your days in spiritual practice and spiritual study. They retire to the forest and that becomes the vanaprastha uh, time of life in which one concentrates on attaining spirituality, spiritual understanding, on experience of spiritual truths. And finally, after a long period of that, one wanders away even from that and gives up everything. That means everything. <laughs> they simply go and wander. In the Brahadaranya Upanishad, the great sage Yagyavalkya, actually he had two wives and uh, he, after he gave his basic teachings, he was an oar of Brahman, he gave his, uh, his instructions to his, uh, to his two wives and he told them, okay, now I have finished my obligation in this world, I have done what needs to be done, you take care of your, everything from here on, I will go. Go means leaving everything behind, God alone. God and God alone, this is one, one of the ideas that we talk about. What do you want? I want God and God alone. But actually we want many more things than God because we need many more things. But in those, at that time, the, the, it, this is the ancient tradition, Brahman, uh, Brahmacharya, Gahastya, Vanaprastha, Sannyasa. So Brahmacharya as a student life, uh, Vanaprastha as a householder raising a family. Then Vanaprastha, the family can take care of itself. You're not needed anymore. You go to the forest and spend your time in spiritual study and spiritual practice, trying to attain that which is the treasure of the race, the, is the uh, foundation of human life. Then after uh, another period of this Vanaprastha, this spiritual uh, mentoring, then comes sannyasa. Sannyasa means that everything limited and finite is given up. One simply wanders forth. Of course, nowadays things have become much more complicated. One doesn't simply wander forth. Also, uh, the modern teachers of religion, Swami Vivekananda and Sri Ramakrishna have reformulated that aspect of things. But the principle is the same. The practical uh, nature of it has been uh, altered. But the principle is there it comes a time in everyone's life when wh whatever they happen to be doing, whatever they happen to be necessarily involved in, it's the, the concentration should be on God and God alone. Everything else comes and goes. There's only one thing that has never come and can never, because it has never come, it can never go. There is only one reality which is at the foundation of things. 
There is only one reality which never changes. Everything in our experience is constantly changing. That is its nature. But then, one th if one concentrates only in that which changes, we get a certain facility and there's a certain necessity for doing that, that's fine. The first three quarters of life are devoted to that. The final quarter is sannyasa, God and God alone. And that is what uh, Swami Subodhananda did. At one point, he simply left. He left what? He left. He simply went walking. Where did he go? He went straight ahead. Where was that? Wherever it would go. And uh, so he went, he headed towards uh, toward uh, Varanasi and uh, headed toward the Himalayas. At one point in his life, this is exactly what he did. He simply went. And uh, then uh, if he was in trouble, for some reason there was not enough food or he was suffering from something, uh, then people tried to help him. He refused help. I don't need any help. I don't want any help. So they forced him to accept certain things, uh, some food, some, uh, uh, some money to get him to the next station, whatever. Almost always he simply refused everything. It is God and God alone. In, uh, he was crossing a river at one time, and he did not know how to swim. The water became deeper and deeper and deeper. Finally, it came over his head. And, uh, but he simply, as long as life remains in him, he's determined to go on. Of course, he was saved in that situation. Swami Trigunatita, who was here in, in San Francisco, who built, originally built the old temple, he had one experience like that when he, in his early days. He was uh, wandering from one place to another, and at one point, he, he was crossing a river, and there was moonlight, and he was going from one stone to another as he was working his way across the river. And at one point, the moon disappeared behind a cloud, and he couldn't see anything. So, mother, take care of me. And he took the next step. He couldn't see where he was going, and he came to the other shore. The point is, there comes a time when one wants to give up everything that is changeable. Because as long as one relies on the changeable, it becomes more difficult to access that which is unchangeable. And the, the goal of life is to reach the unchangeable. The, inf the unchangeable is also infinite. The unchangeable is eternal. We give it many names, but that is the goal in these. The, if we study the life of Swami Subodhananda, at one point he was, this was his great yearning. Whatever was, whatever was changeable, he would not accept. Even he was, as I was saying, he was very sick at one time. He refused any medical treatment. He was, uh, he had no funds even for food or anything. He refused every help. Let mother alone come and help. There comes a development in, in our life when that sort of approach becomes central and becomes, becomes the only reality that we want to follow. The subject next Sunday is Mahendranath Gupta, the chronicler of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. 
This talk will be given by Prabhrajika Ananta Prana. Child care is provided during our Sunday lectures. On Sunday evenings, Swami Tatwamayananda holds an online class at 6 p.m. on the foundational texts of Indian philosophy. The Zoom and YouTube links are available on our website's homepage as well as in the monthly email bulletin. On Wednesday evenings, we have Vespers with Meditation at 7.30 p.m. in this auditorium. There will be no Friday class this Friday, November 24th, which is the day after Thanksgiving. Class will resume the following Friday, December 1st. You and your friends are cordially invited to attend all of our services. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer session in Vivekananda Hall, and all are welcome. <clears throat> Om Jyau Shanti Antariksham Shanti Prithivi Shanti Apo Shanti Roshadaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Vishve Deva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvam Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Same Shanti Redhi Om Shanti 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 Om Peace is in heaven, peace is in the sky, on the earth and in the waters. The herbs, the plants and the trees are full of peace. The gods are peaceful. Everything in the universe is pervaded by peace. May that infinite universal peace enter our soul and being. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us all.
कखन प्रकृति कख शून्य गे कख पुरुष कख प्रकृति कख शून्य गे मायर भाव भाविया कमलाकान्त ए भाव भाविया कमलाकान्त सहजे पागल हल रे श्यामा किलो रे श्यामा किया कलो लोक बोले खाली कलो लोक बोले खाली कलो अमर मन तो बलना खालो रे श्यामा किया कलो रे श्यामा किया